shoe boxes in the bag, so make sure you grab your shoe boxes today. We have three weeks to get on field. They will be due back here Sunday morning, um, Sunday the 21st. Um, First Baptist of 96 is the new drop-off location. So I think the last day is the 22nd for them on Monday, but we're going to take them over there that Sunday the 21st. So make sure you have your shoe boxes back and packed. You don't have to wait till the 21st. You can go ahead and start bringing them back, and we'll start lining them up down the front like we always do. Um, the good news is we do have our 500 supplied, thanks to the to the, the to you as individuals and the various women's ministry, children's ministry, the various ministries in the church jumped in to help out, and we do have the 500 uh, shipping taken care of. So praise the Lord for that. So we will be able to send those 50 without you having to pay for those, those first 50. Um, I have others that have told me they're going to be donating as well, so we'll see what the final total is on the shipping once the final donations come in. I did put out 100 boxes in faith that we can get, because I know some of you like to pay for your own shipping because you like to track that package, and I don't blame you. But um, So that is still an option. You don't have to let the church do it. You can do it yourself. We, I would like to send 100, but we do have 50 boxes paid for, so praise the Lord for that. So grab your boxes on the way out the door today, and we'll see how many we get over these next couple. Let me make a couple more announcements. Um, the women's ministries will be meeting this Tuesday, November 8th at 6.30 in the Fellowship Building. Um, please join them if you can. I know they have a great time. I know they do a lot of good things, so please join them if you can. Um, also, the Men's Fellowship will meet this Thursday, the 10th at 6.30. So, y'all will please stand as you go and we have a word of prayer. Also, remember today is Pastor Appreciation Day, so you'll get to get to experience that later. But let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for allowing us to be in your house this morning. Father, I pray that we can have, we'll have a great service today. It'll go according to your will today, oh God. Father, I pray that if any of us need you today, if any of us don't know you today, that we understand that these altars are open, that prayer, your love, it is all here today. I pray that, that we will come up here, we will allow you into our hearts, into our lives, and that we will allow you to do the work that you need to do in our lives, oh God. Because without you, we can't do it. We can't do anything without you. So Father, I pray that, that we have a good time of worship today. I pray that we get something from this message we will receive today. In your loving name, we do pray.
other shore. And the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection we'll share, when his chosen ones shall gather to their homes beyond the sky, and the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. The second verse it says, on that bright and cloudless morning, hallelujah, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection we'll share, when the chosen ones shall gather to their holy arms, and the road
<coughs> Let me say, first of all, on behalf of my family, thank you so much for your appreciations. I will say that because it's not just today that you decide that you're going to appreciate us, but you, you truly show that all the time, your honor and your um, <coughs> working with us is, is truly a blessing to us. We are, we are, we're very blessed. Lee and I, we know this. Our girls certainly 100% agree. We are blessed to be at this church. We are blessed to be with you. We believe we're supposed to be here. And I, I just I want to thank God for His in His providence. He placed us here with you, and that we get to enjoy this journey together. I'm glad for all that you are. You saw Miss Peggy wearing that orange up here, didn't she? Did that on purpose. I just want y'all to know that, that that she did that on purpose. She laid that Clemson bag right there just so I could test. I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> but it's fine with me. I know who you are, and I appreciate who you are. I don't, I don't, I don't want you to change other than to more like Jesus. So more of what He wants you to be, and that's the same thing that I'm praying for me. But I, I've always thought about we are working together, and that is simply the way I do think about it. I can't do it alone, and you can't do it uh, as outside of what God has called us to do. He did it, appoint apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers. That's what he did. But he did that to serve the saints. So God's heart is on you. And I have to say, I certainly would not be nearly so prideful enough to say that I, I am I'm an, uh, a great pastor in any regards. But I will say he gave me a pastor's heart. Because I love you people. I truly do. I've loved everyone I've had the opportunity to serve, so I will travel sometimes to, to different places. I, I buried two former members this past year. Why? I just, it's not my job anymore. But this is not about a job. This is about a heart. God loves His people. And if I can express that, and, and we as a family, if we can express that in things both great and small, we intend to do that. And so I just want to say I appreciate you. I thank you for all of the wonderful things that you, you do for us. Um, we were given some time back an a, a opportunity to go and visit the Narrow Way Theater. And we got to do that last night. So thank you for that for that gift, those of you who gave that. And um, beat First Baptist there. They came the next night. We got to see it before they did. Wonderful. If you have an opportunity to go to the Narrow Way Theater in um, Rock Hill, I encourage you to go. One song just stands out. I'll be singing that one for a, a long time. It was a good opening to the Christmas season, I thought. And I, I love this season, and I love the, the season of Thanksgiving because we have much to be thankful for. Amen? Amen. I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about pastor appreciation now. I'm talking about God's appreciation. Much to be thankful for. So I also want to thank God the middle school. Y'all notice? Look, look, the middle school. There's people there. It's not empty. Hallelujah. So, so. <laughs> So I'm, I'm happy about that. It looks, looks well, well proportioned, and I love that. Also, I want to thank God. Um, next week, I'm excited about, we are going to celebrate something we have not celebrated before. I felt it was important, and we are going to intend to do this as a weekly thing. We, as a church, we celebrate our families as we should. Families are important. They speak to God in a way nothing else can. God uses that language, and we are to celebrate that. We celebrate mothers. We celebrate fathers. They ought to be because God has created us. But we've never celebrated singles. You know, there's, there's people that the Bible also talks about. And it says they say something that couples and families cannot say. So while I'm very thankful for all our wonderful families that are in this church, and there are wonderful families here, I'm also thankful for those wonderful singles that make up a part of the church. And every church I have ever been at, and really, the world that I live in. So we're going to, it is, it is November, so 1-1, one, one, we're going to celebrate the ones. And we're going to have some highlights next week for those, those singles, but a message for everybody, because we celebrate each other. And unfortunately, sometimes we pick up the world's culture. We do. If you don't have somebody, you're nobody. That's the world. That's not the Bible. Let the world preach that. The Bible says singles say something significant about God that nobody else can say. So we're going to highlight that tomorrow and honor those that come uh, in, in, in next week as we celebrate our singles. Also, um, we have some folks that are wanting to join the church. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Work on that a little bit. Hallelujah.
Praise God. So we're going to plan for that. Um, we're still working through the process, but we're planning for that the week before Thanksgiving. So this is going to be a Thanksgiving month. That's what we're just going to make it. We're just going to give God thanks for everything that we possibly can because I promise you, we'll not exhaust the list, but we will be a more thankful people. I can hear uh, Dr. Benson say, and, and in my memory from long ago, a holy people, that's how we talk. I'm not making fun of him, that's how we talk. A holy people is a happy people. And you know what? I've never found him to be wrong. If you're unholy, man, you're miserable and you're not very thankful. But if you're a holy person like God, you will be thankful, truly thankful. So I want you, I just want to highlight those things. So we got some special things coming next week and the next few weeks. We have some special things coming up in December. I'm very excited about both the teens and the children are going to, are going to really demonstrate um, some things during the Christmas season. We'll talk more about that later. This is called a tease. So that's, that's all it is. But I also want to revert just a moment and say thank you to Amy and to Beverly and for all those who made our Harvest Festival last week an absolute success. You should give yourself and this church a hand. I saw what went on and I was proud of what this church presented. I was proud of the environment. They came and they stayed. I don't know if it was because of the day before or whatever, but they felt comfortable enough with what we had that they just wanted to hang around the people of God. You know what? That's what I want. Drive through doesn't work for religion. This is really doesn't. It's about relationships. It's about connections. And that's 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 what what I, I I've, I've always felt is very important. And I'm so glad for this opportunity. Every department has opportunities to do this. I'm glad they do. But this was the one that the, the children's department really took the lead in and said, let's make connections with the kids and their parents. We did that. I've had people say it was outstanding. It was wonderful. Even somebody who just served, they, they put up part of the, the balloons and, and the rides for us out there said that was the best organized place that they had served uh, during this entire season. That's not somebody from this church. He didn't owe me anything. He's my mailman. That's, that's just it. But he had to say it. And, and I, I wanted to pass that on word to you because you have a reputation about this past weekend in the community. So I want to thank God for that. I want to thank you for all the people who worked hard to make that possible. Because it doesn't happen unless you participate. So thank you for all your participations and for all that you continue to do. Not all that you do is seen, and I'm aware of that, but God knows what you're doing. And I believe this church is blessed because of what you do and what we do for Him. Amen? Let's turn to His Word now and let's focus on Him. We've been looking at Haggai. Chapter 1. I'll give you extra time to find that one. It's not Haggis. It's not Habakkuk. It's Haggai. So once you find it, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand. Haggai yeah, chapter 1, beginning with verse 2. I'm just going to read a few verses, then I'm going to skip down to verse 8. We will be referencing a number of verses in these first two chapters, but I just want to give you the context, and then I want to just, just set the scene so we can see it together. This is what the Lord of hosts says. This people say, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have so much, bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves no one is warm. He who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Almighty God, we come before you today 
a day of thanksgiving. I want to thank you, O oh God, for the pastoral calling. God, I don't take that calling lightly. I not only do it others within this congregation taking that same calling. It is a horrible, difficult, beautiful, wonderful, difficult calling. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. Thank you for that calling. In fact, God, thank you for all your callings because they carry the same frustrations, but also the same blessings and the same legacy. Thank you, O oh God, for all these gifts to us. Father, I ask you in this that you would speak to us. For at best, we shepherds, we teachers can only be those in a human realm. Because God, that's our limit. But oh God, you are our great shepherd. You are our great teacher. You are our leader and you are the apostle of our soul. God, speak to us today. And dear God, I ask you to use my simple words to convey your eternal message to the people you so love. Not one day goes by that your passion dims for them to experience the full salvation you have bought at Calvary. So lead us in your way, and to the name of Jesus Christ be all glory and praise, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. This is an intriguing part of Israel's history. They have been in captivity. They have returned from captivity. They are building up the ruins of their former lives. Generations ago. They're starting back with new hope and new vigor. And they have not, they have not left out the Lord in those plans. They planned for the Lord's temple to be built. They laid its foundation and opposition came. And when opposition came, they didn't stand and fight. They didn't say, I'd rather die first. They quit. And they went to their homes and they minded their own business. And the temple of God lay as an empty foundation for year after year after year after year after year. Nothing was built. If they worshipped, it was of their own making because there was no place to worship. There was no house for God's presence to dwell. It was just an empty foundation. And they went on about their lives. God took note that His people were preoccupied with things other than Him. And I found some resonance with that story here in our modern world. Let's be honest, people, today. Is it easier to do the hard work and follow God? Or is it easier just to quit? And just mind your own business. And go about it. And do whatever seems to be the norm for most people. Well, that's especially, that is especially keen for us to be aware of because as we, as we stood so strong during COVID, I mean, we did anything. We were out in cars. We were, we were in the heat of the day. Whatever we could do, we did. But then afterwards, when things have pretty much got back to normal and everything's flowing freely, it's easier to quit than to keep going. Easier to say, well, that time is over. And so now in 2022, all that people have done for thousands of years following Christ, you know what? It's just not worth it anymore. Let's just quit. Well, we're in that day. I don't think there's that. I think there have been plenty of those type of days throughout the generations. I don't think we're unique in that. But I think Israel really highlights to us the danger of thinking God doesn't notice what is going on about his house. That God doesn't notice what's going on about his business. And I, I kind of related that to, to, to something in my growing up pop culture that I thought was, a, was analogous to this situation. Now, maybe some of you uh, grew up in the uh, Looney Tunes era. I'm not going to ask who. I watched it as a kid, too. But if TB will give me that first picture, you may know what this little thing is. Anybody know what that is? That's Bugs Bunny. I know who that is. What is that? No, that wasn't a Martian. Martian, he had the other helmet, and he was green. Gremlin. Ah, some of y'all watched it more than others. 
But that was a little gremlin. Um, gremlin is a 20th century invention. I don't know if you knew that or not. Came from England. We'll blame them Englishers for something else. But there was a lot of mechanical problems that went on in Air Force when they're trying to, when they're trying to get those airplanes up and, and all that technology. And they fought two world wars. So there was a lot going on with mechanics in the 20th century. And a lot of things would go wrong. And so you know what they blame it on? Gremlins. Gremlins. Gremlins is messing it up. Gremlins is making it harder. Gremlins is, 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 is taking this stuff apart and making it more difficult. So that was their, their go-to excuse. Or if they were fighting against anything, they were fighting against the Gremlins. Well, in good pop culture status, we looked at that. Hollywood has never seen a bad idea they didn't like. Or a good one. Man, they think some good ones too. But they decided to upgrade it. So maybe some of you remember this. Now, they, they, they don't look like the first one. That's a gremlin. Um, don't remember. Don't, don't remember his name. Look at him in the summer. Gizmo. Okay. So knows a lot about that one. Why is he so cute? They like money. Come on, you can sell this fifty nine ninety five. What you talking about? Of course it's cute. But there were in this iteration of the legend and of the mythology, they added some rules to it. I don't know. They make sense. But they were there. So if you didn't obey the rules, bad stuff happened. We can't have, we always have Ewoks. Ewoks are just sweet, so we gotta have Ewoks with an edge. So if you fed them after midnight, if y'all ate after midnight, that might explain a lot of things that I don't know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. If you fed them after midnight, all of a sudden they turned from cute little fuzzy little creature that you can buy at Toys R Us to ugly demon looking creature just for eating food. I mean, really? Were the dietitians that rough on us even back then? You're turning this thing who wanted them to do the mischief and make absolute chaos out of everything they could possibly find. So in essence, to take up their gremlin status to the floor. I found that's like biblical idols. You want to mess up your life? You want, to, you want to really malfunction in your, in your being? And you want to have things go wrong? You feel wrong? Things are going wrong and, and nothing's really right? Have an idol. Take one. Take two. They multiply. You can, you can have as many as you want. And Israel did. Well, now, preacher, you didn't read that in there. You didn't read about an idol in there. God assumed he knew what he was talking about. And they knew exactly what he's talking about. He said, hmm, I'm looking at your house and I'm looking at my house. Your house has paneled walls. My house has a floor. You're living in luxury because you're not building my house. Where do you think the idol was? The idol was themselves. Can I give you a hint? That's all an idol ever is. I want things to go right my way. I'll do whatever it takes for me to get my way. I will sacrifice anything. I'll do anything just to get it to suit me. And in fact, I, I, you know, in, in this modern world, been in church a long time, people have idols of church too. Because if church ain't my way, well then I'll go down the street and I'll make a church that does suit me. When, when is that in the Bible? Did the Bible say, I don't like the church, therefore I'm going to build my own church, and if I don't like that one, then I'll build my own church? There are reasons for different churches, but that's not one of them. If you don't like the carpet, get over yourself. If you don't like the paint, chip in extra money. We'll be glad to paint it for you. If you don't like it, that's not why you're here. Don't make the things of your life idols to suit you because then you could find yourself exactly like the ancient Israelites. What's happening to them? My crops aren't coming in like they should. My flocks aren't producing like they should. And doggone, didn't I just get paid this week? Where'd all that money go? God said, hello? You want my blessings, but my building is the floor. 
You want my favor, but you haven't done one thing to do what I want you to do. You want the blessings of my hand, but you're not seeking my heart. Sound like there's a gremlin that got in their midst. And God will say, the idol is yourself. You live in paneled houses. Now that come by money, didn't it? I mean, to, to make those walls, you had to be making money, which concerned their work. You had to be making good money, and they did. You had to be concerned about your family, your job, your community. So you did all of those things, but he said, my house is in ruins. He wasn't even nice enough to say that's a nice floor. He said, that's a ruin over there, and you call that my house. So in essence, you have cared more about your own then you cared about the things of God. And I'm just going to take away your things. That's what he said. So there are really no gremlins. And idols really have no favor. But idols offend God. We know this, don't we? We understood this. We've read the Ten Commandments. Right? What, what is the first commandment? The very first one. You shall have no other gods before me. I'm number one. I come first. What I want matters more than anything else. They got it backwards because they were afraid of the king, because they were afraid of nations, because it was easier for them to say, I'm not a Christian, than it was to say, or to say I'm a believer in God rather than say that I am. And the same is true today. Easier to say I'm a Christian? No. Easier to hide it? Easier to just be a success and your success will testify to God. Yes. But that doesn't mean you're doing God's work. It's an idol. He says, consider your ways. Consider what you're doing. Consider what's happening in your life. Well, there's three things I want to give us today. Very three simple things. It's not complicated. Very three simple things to try to diagnose if something is rivaling God in our lives. If there's a, a gremlin or an idol in our life that's messing up life for us and maybe we've learned to live with it. But that doesn't mean we should. Maybe we've learned to get along with it. But maybe we should. Maybe we need to take another tact in this thing. The first thing. Is your soul all scratched up? Is, is there something irritating? Are you ill all the time? Without, without, a, without a physiological reason to be ill, are you just ill for no reason whatsoever? And if you don't diagnose it, I promise you, somebody around you will. Why are you so ill? What's wrong with you? Maybe that's a little highlight. Maybe, maybe something's going on that needs attention. Again, I'm, not, I'm not taking off the table anything physiological going on. Go to the doctor. But if you've got an ill spirit, I say the same thing. How about you go to the doctor? Quit trying to fix it with your own stuff. Quit trying to say this or that of the world will fix it. How about come to the altar? How about bow your head and say, Dr. Jesus, I need something to soothe the wounds of my soul today. Maybe you didn't even do it. Maybe somebody did it to you. But as I recall, the Bible says there's a balm in Gilead. His name is Jesus, and he brings comfort to all of those who are sore of spirit. He even said, if you're heavy laden, come to me, and I will give you rest. Take him at his word or go back to your own life. But when it doesn't work out, don't complain to God. Our souls do get irritated. They get scratched up by the things that were not made for us. I shared with you Wednesday night. We're having a, we're having a good discussion on Wednesday night. It, it, it's, it's, it's really heavy, especially this week's spiritual work. <laughs> But I just read, he's, he's, he's a commentator. He's a national white commentator. He's a Jew, which is, which, which is, which is not, not unusual in and of itself. But he's a Jew that became a Christian. That's a little bit different for somebody that's, that's on the national stage. His, his name is Andrew Clayman. And, you know, I'm not here to talk about whatever his politics is. But he wrote a book about, about Christianity and how he's related that to, he loves to write books. He's, he's a He's not only a screenwriter, but he's an author as well. He's tried to wrestle with, with Jesus as he is. Because he's not, he's not trying to pretend to be a good Christian. He says, I'll read Sermon on the Mount. And I don't agree with it. You slap me, I'm going to slap the devil out of you back. I'm not going to turn the other cheek. You take my coat away from me, I'm not handing you my cloak too. I'm 
will jerk it back and haul you to jail. That's, that's natural. That's how it feels. He says, I don't like it. I don't agree with it. How do I do this? He's really wrestling with the text. Really what Jesus said. What it means to follow him. And his son, in his wisdom, they were sitting there together. And he said, Daddy, sounds like you're trying to learn philosophy instead of getting to know the person. And that's some good wisdom from, from a man that was half his father's age. Have we become guilty of that as Christians? Are we following Christian philosophy? This is what you do as a Christian? Because that is significantly lesser than following a person that's got a real mind, a real heart, a real mouth, and a real intention for our lives. Christian philosophy can become an idol. Christ cannot. Do we follow a tradition or do we follow a person? So what is what is satisfying to your soul? I can probably the Christian religion will not satisfy your soul. But the Christ of Christianity, Amen. he will. And I don't want to say it because he's not an it. I, I'm not, I'm not going to be dumb and call, call God what he didn't call himself a sheep. I, I'm not going to remake God in my image. This is what he said. I will take him at his word, and I can tell you, as I've done that, and as some of you have done it, who can testify? He knows how to satisfy the soul. He knows how to take that junk and that stuff that's so irritated me. A lot of times, you know what the problem is? It's me. When he got me out of the way, or when something even more gracious. Because I'm not really good at getting me out of the way. But when I humble myself, that's what he told me to do. He didn't say get right and come to me. He said, if you'll humble yourself under my hand, under my authority, if you'll just say, God, I don't know how, but I surrender to you. Let me tell you, he takes those words seriously. Something leaves and someone comes in. Let me tell you, he satisfies the soul. That's why he doesn't want idols. That's why he doesn't want our soul irritated. He says, I leave you peace. Not trouble. I leave you peace. That's the God who satisfies our scratched up soul. Second thing we can look at to see if there's some gremlins messing up our lives or some idols taking us away from God is that old thing eats up your time. This is a hard, hard one for us today because we have so many things to occupy our attention on. We don't have kids sitting around saying, I'm so bored. They don't even get to do that. They don't. Where do you see a kid acting like that? You don't. What do you see them doing? <laughs> While you're eating. That's what they're doing. While you're having a family gathering. That's what they're doing. I saw, I saw people in the parking lot while I was, while I was on my phone. They were on their phone. <laughs> I can be guilty too. But I really didn't want to go shoot marshals for that long. So I think I deserve just a little, little, little grace there. But it's it's constant, it's total, and it's like the opposite of boredom with no purpose. It's it's just activity with no purpose. You're constantly viewing your world, and that's what I thought about. In that place, they can live in their own world 24-7. They don't ever have to get out, they really don't. They will just hang around people that are close to their world. And if you're not in their world, they'll hate you from afar. I don't like you. They, coming together? Oh, we don't do that. Coming to one night? Oh, we don't do that unless you agree with me. We, we won't do that. So we stay in our own little world, and those things can eat up a lot of time. Anybody ever got on there to just look for five minutes? Did you stay for five minutes? Or did you look at, oh my goodness, was I on that long? It ate up your time. So what does that mean? It means I better pay attention to that. That's doing something for my soul that Jesus ought to be doing for my soul. That means that catches a lot of my attention. Perhaps I should evaluate if it has an appropriate amount of my attention because the devil, not only when it gives us evil temptations, he wants to busy you with things that aren't the work of God. Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. I must do what he's called me to do. I don't have time to waste. And if you're only living the 33 years, you can understand. He had three years to do everything he was going to do. And then he's done. 
I found 51 years is not quite enough. How about for you? Do you need a little more time? Then be aware of what is eating up your time. Because that thing, I'm not saying guaranteed, but that thing can be an idol that you have made. And can I, I, idols are not bad things. Idols can be very good things. They're just not God's things. Anything can become an idol if it, like the first commandment says, you put it before Him. This, this, I, this, this little reminder I got from me, um, I, I'll just share it with you because it, it, just, it just seemed to, to speak to me about the things of life. Because we do get busy and things eat up our time and we look at days, turn into weeks, turn into months and we think, what I wanted to do, I didn't get done. You know, I, I, want, to be, I want to be more involved in church, but you know, it, just, it seems to pass. I, I really wanted to, 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 to sing that solo, but you know, I just, I just I don't have the time. I, I, we make excuses for time passing and all of a sudden, a lot of time passes and we're thinking, oh my goodness. You know, maybe I better get on the stick if I'm going to actually do something for this life and intend to do that. So this is what the Lord spoke to my heart. Dreams lead to inspiration. Wonderful things. Inspiration leads to intentions. Good things. Intentions leads to plans of action. Good things. And all are absolutely worthless at judgment day. They are. Dreams... God doesn't care about your dreams. He gives dreams. But He intends you to do something with them. Inspiration? He inspires us. That's wonderful. Oh, that's exciting. What does that mean? Nothing. Intentions? Oh, where's that path to hell? What is it paved with? Good intentions. And intentions leads to plans of actions. That's action that you get excited about that you never get around to do. They're worthless. Jesus said, do my words. Don't just hear my words. He said, get out and live this life I have put before you. Don't plan to do it. Don't intend to do it. Don't dream about it. Church of God, do it. You don't have time to waste. We have just another example. When do you know the time of your departure? Are you ready for it today? I buried my cousin this week. I didn't do the burial, but I was there. All her life was reduced to this little box. And what's in my memories and the memories of those around me. That's sobering. It's really sobering. But when I saw that flag being folded, again, I was struck once again of the service that was rendered. And the sacrifices that were made. How about you intend to do something for the government? <laughs> that didn't work that way. Dream about it. Mm -mm, no. They make you do it. And you know what? It's so fulfilling. Even if horrific, I've never seen too many veterans that are not proud of the service that they were able to render for their country. You know what? I've met some mature Christians that have said the same thing. I don't regret anything I have done for the Lord or I have done for His house. I regret none of it. You know why they didn't regret it? Because they actually did it. At their dream, their, their plans wasn't to eat up with, with time that, that they could have spent doing something. They actually did it. So look at what eats up your time because that might be something you need to take care of. Thirdly and finally, that old sabotage. That's what, that's what this is all about. What really messes up your life? The, the beautiful part about the story is God's intentions. And that's what I wanted to highlight to you here at the end. Was he upset because they didn't obey him? Sure. Was he upset because, well, you've got nice houses and your families are cared for and your jobs and your communities are built up and you're prospering, but you don't care about my house, you don't care about my worship, you don't care about the place that houses my glory, you don't care about those things? Yes, he was upset about that. But the biggest thing is God had a plan. And when God has a plan, He wants to implement that plan. And God has said, I choose Israel. And we Gentiles say, did He pick them dumb Jews? Yes, He sure did. And right after that, He picked them dumb Gentiles. He did. Why, God? You could choose the most brilliant, the most powerful. You could choose angels to come down and do your work. No. It doesn't highlight my glory. Like when I take a Jew and I make him my child. 
or I take a Gentile who doesn't even belong to be in the vine, I graft him in and I make him my child. Then whose glory is revealed? My glory is revealed. Go, look, go back with me to verse 8. He said, I want you to go up to the mountains. Notice he said, do something. <laughs> go up to the mountains, bring wood, and build my house. Do something. We're talking about it. Quit debating it. Do it. Why? Did you notice that? Why? Somebody should put this at the top of their church somewhere. Build the temple that I may, verse 9, no, that's actually the latter part of verse 8, that I may take pleasure in it. Whose pleasure is the house of God for? It's for the pleasure of God. So every song, Brother Jimmy, ought to be to please Him. And He ought to hear it from a grateful people that means it with all their heart. Every action, every greeting ought to be done in Jesus' name. Every act of love ought to be done to bring glory to Him. You ought not talk about you. Look at what I'm doing. God forbid. You ought to say, look at what the Lord has done. You ought to stand up and say, thank God for my family. I could have married a drunk. I could have married a bum. I could have been four times divorced. I could have had messes all over my life. God has preserved me. God has given me not only good things, He's given me what I don't deserve. Amen. So that the, 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 the demographic of the church did not talk about what the world messes up, but talk about the grace that blows in. Look at what the Lord has done. The world and sin makes messes. Hallelujah. But God knows how to put messes together and make something beautiful out of it. Bring Him your ashes. He will bring beauty out of your ashes. That's God. I don't get glory for that. I'm married to one wife, and I'm married to one wife, but I couldn't stand to raise another one. I'm married to one. Honestly. And she puts up with me for the whole process. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But seriously, I don't deserve her. She may not deserve me. You take that up with her. I don't know. I don't really think we deserve the good things that we have. So I have to say, thanks be to God for your grace. Thanks be to God for your grace. You know that puts us all in the same boat? may not be the same area, but we all are thankful for grace. He said, I want to take pleasure in my house and I want to be glorified. So the, all this time this lays waste, you're not bringing me glory. Your house is not bringing me glory. Your paneled houses are not bringing me glory. Your children, your life, your community, you're not bringing me glory. Do what I've asked and bring me glory. That's what brings me glory. Yes. He wasn't finished. That was part of it. If you go down to chapter 2, those of you who have your Bible, turn over, turn over that chapter. If you don't, don't worry about it. God said, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I'm going to shake every nation and they're going to come here. In Haggai, he says, I'm going to shake this world. Everything they depended on, all their idols are going to be toppled off of their stands and they're going to have nothing and they're going to see this glory emanating out of Jerusalem and the nations are going to come here. And he says, they're going to come to the desire." Mm. Oh, hallelujah. They're coming to the desire of the nations. Everybody from coast to coast has brokenness. Everybody's been, been manipulated and ruined by sin and idols. Everybody has it. But there's a hunger. There's a longing. There's someone that loves us better than anyone else. There is someone that loves better than a brother, better than a mother, better than a wife or a husband. There's someone who loves us so much that he promised, I'll do whatever it takes to redeem you. When we flip over to the New Testament, there's a cross put up. There's a Son of God put on it. And He bled and died to show you, I love you. Period. No promise. No question mark. That is how I feel. Somebody needs to talk about that. And Haggai said, the desire of the nations we're all coming to. And then he says, I'm going to feel my tears. I'm going to feel it with my glory. So Israel, get out of the way. The 
blessings of God have been piling up in heaven. And they are supposed to flow down this channel through them to the nations. But they keep wadding. You know what a wadi is? That's one of those things in the desert. It's a little stream that's there when it's really good. Then it dries up when, it, when, when the trouble comes. So they keep doing this for their family. They keep doing this for their community. They pull a little bit more off for their job and, until the, the flow just doesn't flow anymore. But God says, that's not my plan. My plan is for the world to see the desire that they've longed for and to see my glory. Yeah. Well, preacher, that's Old Testament. <laughs> Have you read 1 Peter chapter 2? He said, every one of you are living stones. Yeah. Stay by yourself. It's not my plan. He said, you are being built stone by stone. Place by place into a house. Guess what that house is for? That house is for the glory of God to be found. This church is beautiful. It doesn't compare to the beauty that you are. See, you folks look at me and you tell me all the stuff you're not. I'm looking at you this morning and telling you who you are. God has redeemed you. God has called you His own. God has removed your sins as far as the east is from the west. You are His people. Peter went on to say, you are kings, you are priests, you are my people called by my name. So guess what? I want you to be just like Israel and I want you to pile up those blessings and keep them all to yourself. He said, church in 96, let the flow come. Let the dam burst. And let the blessings of God come to the nations. Because can I tell you, he's shaking this world. This world is being shaken politically and economically and geographically. It's being shaken. And the name of Jesus Christ is being called upon all over the world. But it's also being blasphemed all over the world. It's a war for the very souls of mankind. What's our part? To let the glory of God shine in His temple. Alright, preacher, you can go ahead and do that. I can. I need you. And you need the person beside you and behind you. You need the church of God to be the church of God. Amen. So I'm not saying your plans are bad. But if they're not His plans to show forth His glory, then there's an idol tucked in your closet somewhere that He says has got to get out. It's ruining your life and it's making my plan malfunction and misrepresent in this world. Tuesday's coming. Vote. Jesus is coming. Be faithful. You can't vote every day, but you better serve Him every day. Every day. Why? If I read Haggai right, how can they see His glory? You're overemphasizing that preacher. No. Paul said, how can they hear without somebody to preach? How? So if it's not you, you can't pass it off. You've got to let the glory shine. As you stand, can I tell you His promise? He said, The glory of the latter time shall be greater than the former. Did you hear that? Yeah. The glory of the latter time yes, will be greater than the former. What was the former? Solomon's. Gold, silver, ornate, rich, luxurious. Herod's temple was not that, that stupendous. There were some feet that walked in that court. And they were holy feet that walked in those courts and said, I am the living water. You come to me and you will never thirst. And right outside of that city, he stretched out his arms and he died. And that temple that was built from him, it was filled by the Holy Spirit of God. Has He come and filled your part of the temple? 
Is He glory, shining glory outside of you? Well, as you bow your heads, I'm going to give you this appeal and then we will pray. What's going on in your life? Is something malfunctioning? Is something going off? Is something irritating your soul? Is something just not right? You feel it. It's not really a gremlin. Those are fictional. It is an idol. Something is keeping you from God. I can't say what that is. It may be something He's trying to tell you that you won't receive. Something He wants you to do that you just won't do. I don't know. But whatever keeps you from Him... You ought to quit. It. You ought to get it out. Because God has something for you. I want to give you a promise. The Lord causes these things to happen ultimately. Here's what Haggai said. He said, I struck you with blight and mildew. I struck, I put hail in the labors of your hands, and you did not turn to me. Now that's a warning. Church, don't do that. If trouble has come, come to Jesus. Come to Him. Pray to Him. Take time with Him. Don't ignore Him and what He's trying to do in your life. Don't ignore that. That is the worst possible thing you can do. The very next verse. He says, the vine, the fig tree, the olive tree have not yielded fruit. Recognize where you are and what you're needing. But this is the promise that I want to leave with you. If this day you will say, God, I don't have it all worked out, but I surrender to you. I don't know how to do this. I don't have the courage and strength. God, I just surrender to you. If you will just do that, here is his promise. From this day, I will bless you. He doesn't say make up for the past. He doesn't say work harder because you're so messed up. No. From this day, I will bless you. So if you need to come, please come. Some will already come. If you need to come, don't be a stranger to God. If you don't want to take a step forward, take a seat, take a knee, bow your head, talk to Jesus in the way that's easiest for you. Don't talk to the preacher. I'm not your intercessor. I can't do anything for you. You talk to Jesus. He understands you and He calls you to Him. I'm going to pray. You join me in that prayer wherever you are and whatever you need. God, before we have a final prayer, I, I just want to re-emphasize again we can't relate to ancient Israel, their importance. We put them on a higher pedestal than I think we should. The world needs what the church has. Will somebody amen me? Amen. Because they do. Through various circumstances, I could talk to you about later. I end up one night of our vacation, we're in a pub. I just wanted some food different than America. But in the way things turned out, I end up there in the midst of people probably very unsaved. I have never been in a situation like that. But it did teach me a few things. Everybody in that room knew each other. They couldn't think of anything better than to celebrate a game that won't matter one week from now with each other in that same room, loud and boisterous. And I thought, they need fellowship. They need community. They need something that binds them together. They are very different from me. They live a very different life from me. But they long for the same things that I long for. They long for Jesus. They long to have a place. They long to have a seat because they wanted mine really bad. <laughs> I know more than got up than somebody got in it. I think it equals fans. I declare. I think it would it would be every team. But that really taught me something. I got I think God gave me that opportunity to say the world needs what you already have. Now the sermon may not mean a week uh, mean, mean anything. We may not remember it well enough for next week, like games come and go. I'm going to tell you what, what God has shared with us today is eternal. And it matters a whole lot more than that end score. So what we have is exactly what they need. So don't be ashamed. And don't be afraid to say, I love my church. And I love to work for God in my church. And then God's blessings are certainly going to be shown.